Everyone always has their moments they deem important or life-altering. Most of the time, we are reminded of the good times when we think about them. First day of school, regardless of what school, graduation, marriage, if you really want to go that far, or when you had your first kid. But to really sink in and experience those moments, there's always that one instance where you instinctively know you've grown up. One of the more honest and ambitious examples of this is the 2001 film All About Lily Chocho, one of the first films to incorporate themes of loneliness and disconnection with the internet. And yet, it's a complex and mesmerizing movie about looking for salvation from all the ethereal monotony the New Age has introduced to the world while also trying to break free from the societal norms Japan has put on its youth for decades. This was the hardest thing I've watched for a video so far. Like, when I watched this for the first time, I had no idea what the hell was going on. Fortunately, that's not the case. Obviously, I've watched it like two or three times. But when I did find out how the film was constructed, it was interesting. And as I looked more into it, fitting. Now, All About Lily Chocho is told in a nonlinear narrative, but not in the way we all picture it. Not like films like Pulp Fiction or Magnolia, where it's just a bunch of stories connected into one story. This is, this is just one story, one timeline. It just so happens that the movie begins not with the first act, but with the second act, and the inciting incident happens midway through the film. This is just one of a number of decisions made on all fronts of All About Lily Chocho, which relate thematically to feeling disconnected or feeling lost, just like what I was when I saw this film for the first time. The film intended for me to feel that way, a reminder that this isn't just any ordinary coming-of-age film. It was at that moment I knew this... this was an experience. Set in the year 2000, the actual movie begins with a hypnotic dreamlike sequence which sees our first main character, 
let's say, 14-year-old Yuichi with headphones on, listening to music, which frequently cuts into white text on a black screen. This is brilliant, because before we know anything about this dude, we know he's the type of person who wants to be in his own space, his own world, and later on, we find out why. It's later revealed the text is a part of a conversation in a chat room run by Yuichi, who goes under the name Philia, surrounding the underground alt-rock star Lily Chocha, with Philia being the name of, I believe, Lily's former band, or the band that she used to be with. It frequently cuts between his conversations and his life as we are introduced to his family and the prospect of having his name changed and the gang of boys he hangs out with, among them a boy named Hoshino, who mainly treats him like shit. Back at the chat room, a new fan arrives named Blue Cat, and talk of a new Lily album is making the rounds, but unfortunately, back in real life, when that album is released, Yuichi steals it from a music store and gets caught. A teacher from Yuichi's school saves him from being arrested, and his mother only expresses disappointment and sports a boys-will-be-boys type of attitude about the whole matter. This is also where we are introduced to Yuichi's love interest, Kuno, and the school they both go to. The group he hangs out with finds out he got caught stealing, and he gets beaten up and humiliated by them. Life is pretty depressing for Yuichi, but it wasn't always that way. As we go back in time to one year earlier in 1999, back when Yuichi and Hoshino were good friends and the latter was the best student in their class. One night, Hoshino tells Yuichi that nobody understands him, to which he introduces him to Lily Chocho and her music. Fast forward to that summer and Yuichi, Hoshino, and a few friends go on a trip to the beach. Meanwhile, they meet a man who seems genuinely happy to be there as he tells him it's his fourth time there and he just is a fan of nature. But later that day, they find the man again, only he wasn't alive. He had just jumped in front of a bus. He died in his happy place. Things only get more scarring the next day when the film's inciting incident takes place as Hoshido almost drowns at the beach. This changes everybody on the trip, but none more than Hoshino, a once bright student, no longer the same, once school starts. There, he attacks another kid who is bullying their classmates, he pushes the desk out from under him, and throws a chair at him. They would further humiliate him after school by cutting off his hair and making him crawl in the mud. As the days go by, Hoshino starts smoking and quits the kendo club where he was an avid member with Yuichi. Not long afterwards, the year 2000 arrives, known as the Age of Grey in the chat room, and Hoshino has only gotten worse. He blackmails a girl named Suda in Yuichi's class into what is known as Enjo Kosai, or to put it simply, prostitution, and Yuichi is ordered to follow her and collect her money, to which she only gets a small cut. Basically, Hoshino told Yuichi to be her pimp. On their way home, Suda shows how emotionally traumatized she's become in all of this in an emotional scene and tries to clean herself of what had happened with the garden hose when she gets home. For a little bit, we are introduced more to Yuichi's love interest, Kuno, as she becomes ostracized by her class, as even though she's an excellent pianist, none of her students want her to play, and they bully her off. The second big moment in the film occurs when Yuichi, who becomes a droid to Hoshino's bullying, allows for Kuno to be raped. While this happens, the other girls are watching and laughing, and Yuichi is crying to the side, showing how far the two have come in comparison when they were still friends. The next day, Yuichi meets Suda again, not sad or traumatized, but desensitized at the work they forced upon her. Like Yuichi and Hoshino, she has changed as well. Their conversation ends when Yuichi gives her the CD of Lily's first album. The third act begins back in the chat room where Yuichi admits the Blue Cat that he has thought about committing suicide multiple times, but he couldn't get himself to do it. To which Blue Cat responds that they understand what he's going through. We cut back to the field, only it's not Yuichi this time. It's Hoshino. The pieces come together. We discover Blue Cat is Hoshino. Now the only question is, when will Yuichi find out? Meanwhile, we cut the Suda walking on a field watching the kites above her fly in the air, and she ends up actually messing around with the guys who are flying those kites as she ends up flying one herself. She's always wanted to know what it felt like to fly like a kite. Unfortunately, she tried.
The final resolution is put in the place when Yuichi discovers Lily Chocho is playing live in Tokyo, but Hoshino throws away his ticket so he can't go to the concert, leading to one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the film where Yuichi is dwarfed by the large screen in front of the venue. When the concert ends, Hoshino runs into Yuichi, quickly chats with him, and goes on his way. Yuichi then screams at the top of his lungs that Lily is outside, prompting the fans to run back to the venue. There, while nobody noticed, Yuichi stabs and kills Hoshino. The True Resolution of the Film In this context, by taking someone else's life, Yuichi and everyone else affected by Hoshino can begin their lives all over again. The credits roll and more text appears on the screen, all the while we see all the characters in that same field listening to Lily's music, a way to express how similar their experiences have been throughout the entire film. From what I've said in the plot just now, there are a lot of heavy topics mentioned and demonstrated in the film, but to really understand the significance of Lily Chocho, as well as why I'm talking about this film in particular, we gotta take a look at the years that preceded the film's production and release in 1991, at the beginning of what is known as the Lost Decade in Japan, caused by the collapse of the country's asset price bubble, plunging it into an economic recession that unfortunately, they're still feeling the effects of to this day. But back then, it proved horrible for the youth of the 90s, as they collectively came to a realization that they're never going to rise up to the standards their parents and country rose them to achieve, and eventually, they would go against the Japanese people and their four standards, leading to a wave of youth rage in the 90s that ranged from bullying in schools, backed by a 1996 study where the rates of bullying in both middle and high schools rose sharply, to arrests, which is also backed by a study showing the arrests in minors have doubled since 1990, to singular incidents that I refuse to not only mention, but show in this video because they are some of the most disturbing stuff I've ever read in my entire life. And I'm not even that squeamish. And just talking about it to you guys would just be wrong. Like, I refuse to believe some of that's even real. But regardless, this craze has gone on for long enough and it's been going on so often that... Films were made on the teen delinquency genre, exploring either the topic itself or the factors around its relevance. The genre first catapulted into the mainstream in 1996 with the Takashi Miike film Fudo The New Generation, regarded as one of his more essential films about a group of teenage assassins. The peak of this trend was the 2000 cult classic Battle Royale, which is set in a dystopian future where youth rage has gotten so bad Japanese legislation signed what is known as the BR Act, and the movie pits a group of teenagers against each other in a Lord of the Flies-esque scenario, all for the government's enjoyment. And after a 1998 study came out, which states that 152 students committed suicide during the calendar year, director Sion Sono got the idea to make the 2001 film Suicide Club, which revolves around a suicide cult full of school children and the adults who pass it off as a fad popularized by the media. And right from the opening scene, you could tell how insane this film is. And again, I'm not going to say it because I care about you guys. Hell, if you go farther down the rabbit hole, there's even a fair amount of anime, which also touches on this topic thematically in a way, like Evangelion, although by a very thin thread. And uh, one of the more iconic ones that pop up in my mind, especially when it comes to how teenagers think and their development, fully coolly. Nothing amazing happens here. Everything is ordinary. Meanwhile, as the late 90s crept around the corner, technology played a bigger part of society as well, as the ramifications of its use in everyday life would be taken advantage by J-horror, creating a subgenre known as techno-horror, starting with the 1998 classic Ringu about a haunted videotape, and that one scene with the TV and Jew on the Grudge... <laughs> I don't know how they pulled that off, but that's badass. The use of technology would take a more existential angle on the 2001 horror film Pulse, directed by Kiyoshi Kurosawa. 
The film follows two different plot lines of two people who find their friends have either gone missing or have gone into states of depression after using their computers, the source from one story a floppy disk, and the source for the other a new ISP, or internet service provider, new internet. After years of films made either acknowledging the situation exists and or profiting off of it, Pulse feels like the first film which offers audiences some insight as to why it's still around. In a way, it's a PSA about the dangers of the internet and technology disguised as a horror film. But eight months after the film's release, All About Lily Chocho was released into theaters and would end up serving as the antithesis of what Pulse stands for. Instead of the internet being the cause of the damage, the movie also shows it works as a possible solution, something these kids can go and feel safe and be away from the real world, which, is, which was becoming more dangerous by the year, which leads me to the reasons why I'm talking about this film. First off, I have never heard anybody talk about this movie. Granted, it's a coming-of-age film, and all the other films I just mentioned were thrillers and horror films, but thematically, they come from the same place, and out of all these films... This one, in my opinion, has aged the best. Because all those other films were mainly made for Japanese audiences, when you look under the surface of just a cult genre classic, Lily Chocho touches on themes of violence, isolation, and disconnection in a more general way, which, where it appeals to more than just a Japanese audience, a trend which would continue in the decades to come throughout many different platforms, especially anime, where easily the, the first thing that pops into my mind are the films of Makoto Shinkai, someone who probably was inspired by a number of aspects of this movie, especially when it came to technology, uh, disconnection. I'm getting some Garden of Words vibes, if I'm going to be completely honest with you here. The music was a collaborative effort between the director, Shunji Iwai, singer Ayako Mori, aka Salyu, who hadn't made her debut at the time, and music producer Takashi Kobayashi, who worked with EYE before on a previous film. Singles were being released in April 2000, and Salyu, who went under the name of Lily Chocho, would perform on the music shows Hey 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 Music Champ on June 19th and Music Station four days later on June 23rd. In the film's universe, Lily released her debut album Erotic in 1998 and her second album, Kokyu, or Breath, the following year, while in actuality, Kokyu is her debut record and was released a week and a half after the film did, and a couple of years later, the tr track Healing Wounds would be used in the Tarantino film Kill Bill Volume 1, although if you try to find it in the film's soundtrack, it's nowhere to be found. Since then, the Lily Chocho name has rarely been used until 2010 when the digital single Ether was released, but ever since, Sal Yu would debut under her own name in 2004 and has since been performing Lily Chocho songs live, and is pretty open with having it be a part of her discography. The idea for the film was first conceived in April of 2000. The same time the film's story is set when EYE created a fake message board called Lilyholic where he would post fake messages to each other, and fans on the, of the site can respond to the messages that were posted so far on a bulletin board system. After the main incident of the film occurred, the site was taken down. The only place where you can read the novel is on a CD, but it's only been released in Japan. Four months after the internet novel began, production on the film began and concluded in late September of 2000. More info was posted on the film's official website, but unfortunately, when you go there now, you're reminded that Flash is dead. But when the site was up, apparently, you could read a couple of fake news articles which directly connect to the climax of the film. In the movie, the messages give off the idea that A, the ether is everywhere, as seen by how the messages are interspersed throughout the film, and B, the rock star Lily Chocho is the ether personified, something which was hinted on in that first conversation when many Lily fans say she is exactly that because she was born on the exact day and the exact time on December 8th, 1980 at 10.50 p.m. when John Lennon was assassinated. And they say John had the ether, which is described in the film as the fabric of the universe and the many emotions one feels every day like hope or despair. 
This is also further proven by how much Lily's music is played throughout the film's two and a half hour runtime. At the time of the film's release, Iwai was the first Japanese director to use an entirely digital video camera, the since discontinued Sony HDW F900, also known as a Cine Alta camera, which replicates many of the features of a 35mm film camera. And it was thought Iwai was inspired to do this after seeing his friend, fellow director Hideaki Anno, use digital in his live-action debut, Love and Pop, which was released in 1998. It's the choice of camera and the cinematography by Nomaru Shinoda, which adds to the overall feel of the movie and the dreamy rhythm, thanks to the film's use of long shots and wide-angle shots, so much so that every time there was a wide-angle close-up, it felt like I was watching a Terrence Malick movie before Terrence Malick adapted that style, which adds on to the notion this film is mostly handheld, and if isn't, the framing is still gorgeous. It pairs well with the smart editing by Yoshiharu Nakagami, which is also pretty rhythmic and goes well with the rebellious nature of the film, just oozes out in practically every chance it gets, cutting at key moments after long shots to give off that attitude while also other sequences are shot like music videos, cutting to the rhythm of the music in order to show how connected those characters are to Lily's music. Going back to what I said earlier, the film sticks out among the other films which cover the topic of youth rage. While it doesn't propose a solution to the problem, it still puts in more effort for the long haul and acknowledges it for what it is, a problem. While clearly on a different scale, there is a widespread problem right now, with kids and high schoolers especially experiencing a sense of disconnect with themselves and their friends after spending over a year in front of a computer screen, giving them this false sense that this is what the real world is like, and it's made to fuck them over, among other things, especially for the ones who just graduated and are going to go out into that real world. Fortunately, there are a bunch of people, especially in middle school and high school, who have found ways to cope with how everything is set up, but unfortunately, it's not everyone. This is also one of the reasons why I decided to talk about this movie. Not only do more people need to see it because it's a great movie, but given the climates and struggles today's youth, us, are, are struggling with now that we're at the tail end of the pandemic, it's a movie I think personally a lot of people can benefit from watching. In short, All About Lily Chocho is essential for today's isolated world because it tells teens what they're feeling is normal and gives adults an idea of what is going on in their kids' heads. The only things I could say the film misses the mark on is, is a couple of times where it felt like EY was a tad too ambitious with the camera regarding the 180 rule, but it did next to nothing to break me away from the experience. Overall, although the film has a non-linear structure that may be intimidating on a first watch, the story is easy to follow and was compelling enough to keep me interested throughout its two and a half hour runtime. It's moments like this why I really latch on to movies, and just ones that especially cover topics like this. Not only does it give platforms for people like EY to make these grand, resourceful, energetic forms of artistic expression, but when done right, we can experience what goes on in the minds of someone else completely different. And in this case, gives reassurance to people like this and basically tells them, hey, I know what you're going through, only it does more than that. In this case, all I can merely do is say it, is just say that's what the film does. But with All About Lily Chocho, no matter who you are, or what's on your mind, the moment you press play, it's more than just a set of words. It's ethereal. My name is Payne, and this was All About Lily Chocho. -Cho.